So, let's get the first question out of the way. Why? As in, why now? Why, six years after Ego, Aaron Hansen Raptor released his incredibly controversial dissection of the Legend of Zelda series as a whole, and Ocarina of Time in part, am I using my time and energy to respond to said dissection? Hasn't it already been neatly torn asunder and refuted by so many other responses? Nope, there are only a couple of decent, on-topic responses that I've been able to find. None of them really get to the core of the issue with both Sequelitis, Zelda A Link to the Past vs. Ocarina of Time, which we'll be calling ZS for Zelda Sequelitis from here on out, and Ocarina of Time as a game. We'll get into it, believe you me. But first and foremost, we need to be clear. Most of these responses were for either A, clout from name recognition, or B, the misguided notion that I like game, so game is good. Any criticism of game is saying I like bad game, like some kind of dummy. On the former point, hey, I can appreciate the hustle. Lord knows YouTube basically requires it to get anywhere nowadays. I can't act like I'm not doing the same thing by making this, even if it is about five years too late. On the latter point, well, we'll get into that later. Here's how this is going to go. I'm going to go over the things people got right about ZS. This section is where I'll include my own criticism of ZS. Then. A breakdown of the major issues that run through the various responses I've watched, followed by all of the things people commonly got wrong about ZS, including the absolute most important line that everyone ignored in their responses. And we'll finish off with the big thing that everyone, including Aaron, misunderstood about Ocarina of Time. I should probably say, before we get into this proper, that I agree with the majority of Aaron's assessment in ZS. I had fun playing Ocarina of Time, although I was never able to beat it until the 3DS remake made it bearable to play through the temples. However, Ocarina of Time definitely shows its age. It was impressive for the first outing into 3D for a major franchise, but if we ignore its historical significance, it's a 7 out of 10 at best. There's a lot holding it back, mainly the hardware it was designed for that was improved a great deal as the series progressed on newer and better consoles. With that said, here are the points people got right about ZS in an algorithm-pleasing numbered list. Yeah, no, he doesn't really care about any of these responses, this one included. I don't blame him. He's been making stuff for the internet for most of his life and getting abused in the comments for just as long. I know that it's the new normal to expect slash ignore the really hurtful things people say online, and that I'm going to be called a snowflake cuck for even implying it's a problem. It's pretty ridiculous though. I can't imagine people saying some of these vile things to me when I was like 15. The fact that we expect people to endear such things and don't expect it to affect them is a wildly cruel thing. I'm not saying internet personalities deserve to be handled with kid gloves, but, like, maybe we could treat them like people? Anyway, like most internet people, Aaron has become pretty hardened against criticism of his work, but he did take the time to include a preemptive address of the avalanche of vitriol this video was going to produce. Hey, uh, hey, what are you doing over there? Oh, <laughs> uh... I was just writing my preemptive counter-argument about how you're wrong about my favorite game of all time and the best game ever. Oh, okay. Well, d don't you think that's a little, I don't know, close-minded? I mean, I get you probably liked this game as a kid, but isn't it time we looked at it critically and made a fair analysis of how- No! Honestly, I think this was a bad idea. It would be pretty naive to assume there would be no backlash from criticism of this game in particular. The fanbase for it is very aggressive about their love for it. However, that doesn't mean you need to even acknowledge it. By creating this straw man character to represent the Ocarina of Time crowd as a whole, or at least the more angry side of it, it honestly weakens his stance a little. I get it, it's for the joke, but it undermines his point a little. The little caveat at the end of, now it's your turn to make a counter-argument, that's only fair, doesn't do much to repair it either. Of course, his points are still pretty strong, so really, this is just a nitpick on my part. You don't necessarily need to state your argument in a nice way for it to be a good argument. Yeah, it does. And really, there's no way it couldn't. Game design is an art, don't at me. So the analysis of it is going to be inherently subjective. Any rules you hear are more like rules of thumb than immutable laws. As Aaron said, It ain't even fucking quantifiable. Even the debate of what is art, are games art, is objectivity even possible, has been waged 
and undecided for years. I'm going to come back to this in a later section, but suffice to say that stating an analysis of art contains opinions is effectively redundant. The Legend of Zelda on NES is more opaque than anything, which can be fine if you have the time and patience to find your own way. It's pretty ironic that a lot of people who criticize Eren for being too impatient for Ocarina of Time are, themselves, too impatient for OG Zelda. It mostly ends up as a value statement. Eren values gameplay, and has more patience for it, whereas Ocarina fans value spectacle, and thus have more patience for that. I know there's more to it than that, so let me use an example. Aaron criticized Castlevania 2 for having a lack of direction. Number eight! Where do I fucking go? Yet he praises OG Zelda for doing a similar thing. The key difference is context. In Castlevania 2, you have to take a very specific path, which requires very specific unintuitive actions to advance. Like in Ocarina, this can become frustrating when you're forced to do what are mechanically arbitrary tasks to facilitate the narrative. In OG Zelda, on the other hand, the path is whatever you want it to be. You can follow the specific numbers as a guide, but your way there is up to you. Any design could possibly work, in the right context or with the right supporting elements. But what we've found in the many decades of designing and analyzing games is that the underlying level of agency, aka the power you have to do what you want within the game world, is fundamental to how players will enjoy your game. You can look to Rim DeCoster's video essay on Five Nights at Freddy's and how it denied your agency to create a horror atmosphere for more on that. Ocarina relied on spectacle to distract from the low level of agency it provides, which, as we can see from people's experiences, was pretty effective. It's really telling that Eren's examples of good Zeldas, OG Zelda and Link Between Worlds, are the installments with the least strict narrative structures. We can see what Eren's taste profile is. Low narrative, high agency. The combat in Ocarina of Time was inspired by Japanese combat performances. The original concept was to emulate Chanbara films, which featured tense samurai sword fights. These fights would usually involve long stretches of tense sizing up, trying to anticipate your opponent's plan and find an opening. They'd culminate in quick clashes that would decide long battles in a split second. While developing the game, the team behind Ocarina went to Toei Kyoto Studio Park a sort of feudal Japan theme park that featured live combat performances. During one of the performances they watched, a samurai and a ninja fought. The samurai armed with a kusari gama. The samurai caught the ninja's leg with the chain and, pulling it taut, forced the ninja to move in a circle around the samurai. That's where the iconic Z-targeting circle strafing was born. The issue, as Aaron points out, is that the enemy is controlling the pace of the battle. In the inspiring battle, the samurai has the advantage and controls the pace. But in Ocarina, you play as the ninja, trapped by the samurai into the battle they choose. Also, as Aaron points out, that's not a bad thing. However, when your game introduces an interesting new combat system with the potential to fight in all sorts of creative scenarios, against all sorts of challenging opponents, it can be reasonably disappointing when the vast majority of opponents have very very similar fighting styles. Considering the movement was all based on one specific moment in one fight, it was practically destined to be funneled into one specific feel. The Chambara fights are fun to watch, but there's usually only a few in any given film, with each opponent presenting a fresh, unique style. If they were full of hundreds of fights, one after another, where each opponent is fought in almost the exact same way, they'd be really tedious. Some of the responses try to minimize this criticism by positing that combat wasn't the main focus of the game. But I think it's more that it doesn't feel like the main focus. Even though it's the main thing differentiating it from the previous games, as far as the mechanical design is concerned, they just didn't take the time to make enough interesting opponents. Now, this is probably a technical limitation. You can only fit so much in the 12 to 32 megabytes an N64 cartridge was able to hold. They went with more models and animations and kept the AI to a minimum. The problem isn't that the enemies are partially invulnerable, but that you're forced into a period where you have to track an opponent and have no normal way to damage them. Yes, I know that there are tiny windows that allow you to avoid the bulk of waiting, but the average player shouldn't be held to the standards of a speedrunner. It's very telling that even in the videos defending the game, their responses are consistently, I didn't mind it, it wasn't that bad, etc. When the main new mechanic in your game, 
The combat is something people tolerate rather than celebrate. It's a pretty good indication that you failed in making that aspect sufficiently entertaining. This is honestly the weakest part of Aaron's video. It shows how narrow his perspective on puzzles is. Here's what he says. A puzzle is something you have all the information for. The only thing standing between you and the solution is your own ability to put the pieces together in the right way. The satisfaction you obtain from solving a puzzle is from the aha moment when the pieces fit and you have only yourself to blame for it. If you're missing a piece, how are you supposed to even get to a conclusion? You rack your brain, run in circles, go, what do I fucking do? Until you find the last piece on a whim and suddenly it all makes sense. As any point and click adventure fan will tell you, searching for the pieces to a puzzle is half the fun. There can be just as much satisfaction in finding the final piece to the puzzle and finally being able to link all of the pieces together in your mind. One of the most common mechanics in tabletop gaming is hidden information, like a private hand of cards, because not having all of the pieces and trying to fill in the gaps can also be super compelling. It's a strange stance to imply that Ocarina's puzzles are somehow more shallow than the Zelda puzzles before it. Really, on a design level, Ocarina isn't that different from the earlier 2D Zeldas. You still run around fields and temples, clashing with enemies that obstruct your path, interacting with objects in the environment, and exploring the larger area to unravel the path to the boss. The major differences are the walls and ceiling can now hold interesting elements, the way the floors did exclusively before. Enemies move freely, rather than on a grid, sometimes not even on a surface at all. And your new perspective prevents you from having a full view of your surroundings at all times. That's really it. The puzzles still involve accomplishing a task to open up the path to another unexplored area. Whether that task is hitting a switch or a button, pushing blocks into or out of the way, removing debris that's obstructing the way, or defeating enemies to unlock doors. The puzzles in Zelda have rarely been a single room anyway. It was the entire dungeon itself acting as one big puzzle box that you're slowly opening piece by piece. Something like the Ice Switch is honestly less annoying than the puzzles in OG Zelda, which involved bombing a blank wall or pushing a random block. That's not a puzzle. That's trial and error. The worst example is opening the last dungeon by burning a random tree. Like, I get it, y'all had Nintendo Power walkthroughs, but... How the hell are you supposed to figure that out with your own brain power? What pieces did you have to put together to get the aha moment on that one? Looking for a random wall to bomb or a random block to push or a random bush to burn is no different from looking for a random eye to shoot. There are just more places the eye could be. In Link to the Past, most of the puzzles were just new obstructions in your path that could only be removed by the new item you got in that dungeon, which ended up being more of a key or you know, the last piece of a puzzle? Speaking of, the item spoiling the bosses is a non-point. What, now when you get all the pieces to the how to beat the boss puzzle and are able to solve it, that doesn't count as an aha moment? It just shows how the construction of a puzzle is less inherently satisfying than Aaron posits. The whole rant seems kind of naive to the wide range of puzzles that have existed in gaming, for better or for worse. So, a lot of people have latched onto Aaron's saying in the Game Grumps playthrough of Ocarina that he reneged on the Death Pucks comment. This is the part of the game that people were angry about. Angry about me in Sequelitis. Oh. When I, t when I talked about, like, object permanence and stuff like that. I can't remember that, clearly. Do you remember when I was like, oh, you gotta- you can't see the thing that's coming at you, it sucks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like the spinning ice cubes that were, like, spinning around you. Right. Yeah, um, a lot of people were on my ass because it's like, oh, what, you, what, do you not have object permanence? Which is fair. I, I would actually, like, redact that argument from my video if I could make it again. It's a really tiny, petty victory to cling to, but you do you, I guess. They've also pointed out this moment, where he recommends adding obstacles on a platform that look superficially like the death pucks. The thing is, the two ideas are so mechanically different. The obstacle could be skipped by quickly, rather than something you have to contend with while navigating a slippery ice floor in multiple directions with your perspective constantly flipping around to search for items, Aaron's idea actually does show up later in the game, in the Shadow Temple, with the guillotine gates. I get it, it's 3D, you can't always tell where the player is looking. Except you can, in some situations. When Link enters a room, the camera is almost always focused directly behind him, facing into the room, ostensibly so that you can use the player's perspective effectively since game design heavily involves predicting what the player will be doing at a given moment and planning around that. Another option would have been to lock off the camera, like in Resident Evil, 
to closer emulate the 2D games with their fully visible rooms. They even did that in some areas, like the maze leading up to the Forest Temple, or the Castle Courtyard, where they take camera control away from the player entirely. Also, real talk? The single screens were more interesting. Every screen of Link to the Past has something in it. Meanwhile, Hyrule Field has like three zombies at night and like this spinning thing, I guess? Otherwise, it's just empty space between important landmarks. Anyway, let's move on to... I have minor things I could say about the good ones, but I'm just going to address the major things in the bad ones. This video is where the worst argument cropped up. I don't mind waiting. I didn't think the waiting was so bad. I didn't mind the combat, etc. This is the worst point because it isn't a point. Your personal level of tolerance for a specific mechanic has zero bearing on how well the mechanic is designed. I loved the hell out of Donkey Kong 64 as a kid, but I'm not going to go to bat for it because I can recognize that it's garbage design. That's fine. It doesn't detract from my personal experience of having a blast running around jungle japes getting absolutely nothing done for days at a time. I tolerated the big empty areas, slow, chunky platforming, and tedious collectible placement because I had the patience of a tiny kid. If I see that a game is making me wait, my response shouldn't be, oh, it's not that long. It should be, why is it making me wait? And is that an effective way to do that? What does the waiting add emotionally, mechanically? Narratively, why should you tolerate any aspect of the game design? It was made for your enjoyment. Why did the designer make a choice that frustrates you? Was it intentional? What were they trying to do? The answers to these questions, and the further questions from these questions, are a million times more interesting than, eh, whatever, it ain't that bad. This one really encapsulates the lack of respect people have towards Aaron, who spent years writing and producing ZS when they think their off-the-cuff, crapped-out response with no production value has the same weight. Obviously, the ideas are the most important. However, it's pretty telling that the lower the production gets, the worse these videos get. If you aren't putting in effort on the audio and visuals, you're probably putting just as little effort into the writing. The main point he makes is, Aaron is bad at the game, so his point is invalid. That's not an argument. Roger Ebert made two crap movies and was well-trusted as one of the foremost voices on film. Leonard Maltin has made zero movies, just a ton of academic documentaries. Yet he understands them on a level that even some filmmakers never have. Understanding something on a conceptual level, a design level, has nothing to do with having skill at it. On the flip side, just because you can be good at a game doesn't make it a well-designed game. You can be good at any game with enough practice. Just watch the awful games block during A or SGDQ. These are amazing performances of the worst games known to man. Even if being bad at Zelda, or occasionally bitter and sarcastic about the mountains of annoying responses you get about your playing made you a bad person, that wouldn't invalidate Aaron's argument? This whole thing is just two hours of, I don't like this guy, so I just need to explain why, not disprove his point. His hatred goes far past disapproval of his opinions into full-on bias. This is a major issue with a lot of these. They think Aaron can only be entirely right, or entirely wrong. No matter how much you hate somebody, or how stupid they may be, they can still make good points if they gather the right evidence and interpret it correctly. Overall, the guy behind these videos is just a gaming elitist. He thinks if you aren't amazing at a game, you aren't allowed an opinion on it. The kind of gatekeeping asshat who knows way, way less about games and the people who play them than he seems to think. Basically, the worst kind of gamer. The kind that wants to keep gaming to himself rather than share it with the world. This makes me so mad just thinking about it. On a basic level, it's just absurdly ignorant. Like, I'm shocked hearing this guy has even played the game. He seems to think ZS was about trying to figure out which game is better. The point of ZS, as very clearly laid out in the video, is analyzing how they decided to design a game that already had the foundation of a previous title. 
how they improved or failed to improve. Missing the basic premise of the video is pretty indicative of the problems with this response. I was honestly shocked when he said he wrote this ahead of time. All of that doesn't come close to his conclusion, where he says the absolute dumbest thing about games I've ever heard. My other major issue is that, as I mentioned before, comparing a 2D game to a 3D game is unfair in my opinion. Hey, moron. You know who compared 2D games to 3D games? The people that fucking designed Ocarina of Time. They were the ones who decided what 3D Zeldas would be like. None of these points about 3D need to be inherently longer or more spread out or even remotely correct. Those are all conscious choices the designers made. Aaron's whole point is looking at whether those were good choices. It's literally the biggest hurdle the industry has ever faced. The approaches to the transition are some of the most fascinating decisions in the history of game design. It made or broke entire franchises. Castlevania almost failed because of it. Bubsy did fail because of it. Sonic has been limping along as a shell of his former self ever since. Even if it wasn't the result of years of careful thought from the best minds in the industry, saying 3D just inherently has to be crap is the worst argument you could make to defend a game. Video games are literally just polygons moving around on a screen. They can look, sound, move, and do whatever the hell you want them to. The implication that it just has these built-in rules that must be followed because that's what always has been done is painfully stupid. If you can genuinely look at the history of video gaming, watch an entire 30 minute video carefully addressing one example of it with well-reasoned arguments, and still, still dismiss it out of hand because you seem to think that 3D games inherently have to be the way they ended up doing it rather than having infinite possibilities that could have been done? Dismissing the years and years of careful thought and evolution put into that incredibly difficult problem by saying, eh, they're just too different, can't compare them, you're an incurious idiot. You do not deserve the hundreds of hours of thought, expertise, creativity, and work that went into the games you enjoy. Sincerely, truly, from the bottom of my heart, with every fiber of my being. Fuck you! <sighs> Whoo boy. I need to calm down. Genuinely, that last video makes me furious. It's, it's so insulting. If I missed any responses, keep them to yourself. My heart can't take any more of these. Let's get into what people misunderstood about sequelitis. These are the things that resonated throughout almost every response I saw. They're all pretty fundamentally misguided. This is something that people generally misunderstand, so I'm not surprised to see it here. Just because someone speaks with a confident, matter-of-fact tone doesn't mean they think what they're saying is a fact, nor do they expect you to think so. You shouldn't have to qualify every statement with, that's my opinion, or that's just the way I think. Aaron respects the viewer's intelligence, enough to think they can make the distinction between opinion and fact, or even just understand the basic premise of this opinion piece he made. Given how some of the responses went, he was clearly wrong. However, that's not nearly as important as the next point. So many of these videos stated, Aaron is entitled to his opinion and so am I, which ignores the pretty simple concept that not all opinions deserve as much attention. There are base opinions, like I don't like this game, which everyone has and requires zero work because your brain immediately creates them for you. Then there are informed opinions, like I have a great deal of experience studying games and I have put a lot of time, effort, and research into figuring out why I don't like this game. A well-reasoned, well-supported argument created from an informed opinion will always, always hold more value than a base opinion that's just thrown out as, well, I like it, or worse, well, I don't like you. This was especially poignant because it's become more and more common sense. Similar to how a movie without a theme that just has long scenes of people explaining what's happening in the story ends up being 
pretty underwhelming. A game story that isn't tied to the mechanics and forces you to read hours of lore that explains why you need to go to the next waypoint is not great. The obstacles in a game should feel necessary. At no point in a game where you're helping someone fight a common enemy should you have your path obstructed by someone who is supposed to be on your side? The guard in Kakariko Village, the Zora King, Darunia, fucking Mido? Why would I want to help them if they're doing everything they can to stop me? Why couldn't the guard at Kakariko Village be a landslide? Blocking the path that gets cleared away by the workers after you talk to Impa. That's basically the obstacle you have to clear away up the mountain anyway. In Link to the Past, the people blocking your path were the enemy's knights and monsters. In Ocarina, the people blocking you are supposed to be your friends. Friends! It all makes the world feel antagonistic. Everyone is petty and won't give an inch without a ton of prodding. It doesn't pair well with the far too common game story of look at everything happening to everyone else. Borderlands has a fix for this. I'm not always a fan of their writing, but they at least have an answer for this question. Why isn't your character the focus of the story? It's because it isn't their story. They're just a mercenary hired by the actual main characters. This required a cynical universe full of lazy pricks that can't do anything for themselves, but that remains consistent with the dark sophomoric comedy tone. In Zelda or Pokemon, the story is supposed to be about you champion, hero, etc. In earlier entries, the focus might be shifted temporarily when you wandered into someone else's story, but you were the through line. Your story took precedence. Modern game stories are written entirely about other characters, with the player character plopped in as an afterthought. Your involvement is just watching scenes that don't concern you play out, until one of the characters turns to you and goes, Wow, that was crazy, huh? I know, I'm going to experience more or less the same story as the other players of this game, but they can hide it a little better than this. The creation of art exists in layers of perspective. At the bottom is the viewer or in the case of games, the player. To be clear, bottom doesn't mean that the player experience is necessarily less, just that it's the lowest layer, that the other perspectives are focused around. The player is focused on enjoying the game on an emotional level. They want something engaging and entertaining without being overly frustrated. Next up is the designer, who is invested in what the player thinks consciously or not. Going back to the Mega Man sequelitis, you can see how the designer specifically focuses on what the player will do, how they'll approach a situation, and how they'll react to it. The designer has to think about their own ideas about what will make the game fun, and the player's ideas about what will make the game fun. Above that is the analyst, who's invested in understanding games. They look at both what the designer was trying to do and what the player is going to experience to reflect that back on the efficacy of the designer's decisions. The analyst weaves between all three perspectives to try and get a full picture of what the game did well and not so well. Aaron was looking at the game from an analyst's perspective, on a logical level, to try and understand the game. Part of this was applying his own player experience, both with this game and others. Most of these responses are looking at it purely from a player's perspective, which is inherently emotional. Your opinion from the player perspective is based more on how you felt while playing than an intellectual dissection of the concepts within. This is a totally valid way to experience the game. You can and should enjoy or not enjoy a game for literally any reason that works for you, logical or not. Going back to DK64, I didn't think about whether or not the game was good. I was just having a good time. However, trying to argue against informed, well-studied points about a game's design with your own unexamined enjoyment of the game rather than your own structured argument is, at best, a weak argument. And, at worst, not an argument at all. This is the big one. The thing none of these responses addressed. Technically, in a couple, they made a blanket, I agree statement for everything they didn't mention, so maybe they did get this, but I feel it bears stating. This is the line. The more specific you get about situations analogous to reality, the more you have to stipulate on. This is the issue with Ocarina of Time. They tried to add realism to the world, which made the game a lot less elegant in its mechanics. As Aaron also said, How do you take the simplicity of form that 2D allows Give it a z-axis. The game is heavily focused on atmosphere and environment, which makes sense since they now had this flashy medium that could de-abstract elements that were only sketches in earlier games. But games are all about abstraction. The core of making a game, any game, 
is abstracting things into understandable mechanics. You don't make us control each of Link's arms individually to make him slash his sword. You don't make us turn his head and eyes to see specific things. Abstracting these into single button pushes is the foundation of what makes this a game and not just Gary's mod. In trying to flesh out mechanics like swordplay and a freely viewable 3D world, they ended up creating the same mechanics as in earlier Zeldas, just more cumbersome. They split up single abstractions into multiple awkward operations. Hit left and press B to kill Bat became hold Z and maneuver with the stick while holding and releasing a C button to kill Bat. It isn't the Z axis alone that overcomplicated things. It's thinking that abstractions were holding games back, instead of being their very DNA. Here's the thing. You can argue all day about what Aaron got right, what Aaron got wrong, but here's the real question we need to ask. If Ocarina of Time has these problems, then why do people still engage with it on a genuine level? There was an article in Business Insider called It's Time to Admit Animal Crossing New Horizons is a Dumb, Boring Game for Children. The article goes off for paragraphs about how poorly designed and unengaging Animal Crossing is, but it's really just the writer describing their own personal player experience. Animal Crossing New Horizons was a massive seller, but instead of analyzing why, despite all of its apparent flaws, and how you could apply that to your product and business, since, you know, it's a business magazine, they just announced it as bad and boring because they themselves didn't like it. People can, and have, analyze games up and down, trying to decry certain aspects as inherently bad. If a player still enjoyed a game, if the designer was able to make something that they were able to enjoy, was the game good? What aspects somehow worked? Did they work together or in isolation? Why was the player able to ignore the worse elements or feel compelled enough to find the positive ones? These are the real questions of game design. Not how solid a design is on a granular logical level, but how you can create an illusion that, at least for a little while, engrosses a player and keeps them playing to the end, satisfied with the quest they've undertook. With all of this said, I feel I've pretty confidently made my point. In the interest of fairness, I have made a playlist that I'll link to right about now that goes through the Zelda sequelitis that this is all based around and all of the responses that I included in my ranked list and that I directly responded to here and some other fun things at the end that are vaguely related. I don't know, I got bored, man. This, this was a long video to make and I just needed to find something fun while researching through all these bad, bad responses. If you have any counterpoints, feel free to put them in the comments, but don't expect an immediate response. I'll be doing a stream sometime in the future to address them as best I can, which you'll be able to watch on twitch.tv slash IggyKid. You could also DM me on Twitter, at IggyDKid, with your counterpoint. I wanna thank you very much for watching. I put a lot of work into this. It took a lot longer than I expected it to, and I hope I got you thinking. I hope I gave you some entertainment. Whatever it may be, I hope that you enjoyed this. And I wanna leave you with one last question that still bugs me. Why does Aaron think you gotta roll three times in Monopoly? It's two times, then you get out on the third turn. Also, you could just spend 50 bucks to get out immediately. That's why it's get out of jail free and not just get out of jail. And I mean, 50 bucks is such a pittance in Monopoly. I could sneeze in Monopoly and find 100 Monopoly bucks. Why wouldn't you just go and spend the $50, get out immediately? I, why wait for the card? Why even roll the cards? Just 50 bucks, you're out.